<clears throat> church history. Church history has always been one of my favorite subjects because the truth that you and I hold dear, the truth that you and I possess in our hearts and minds and lives as apostolic Christians, apostolic Pentecostals, can be proven either biblically or historically, either way you want to go. I want you to turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Acts, chapter 2, and let's reestablish, just for a moment in time at least, the apostolic truth. <clears throat> in the book of Acts, the church was not born in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Gospels are the forerunners. They contain the birth of John the Baptist, his forerunnership to the messianic ship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Within the Gospels, you'll find the teachings of John the Baptist. You'll find the teachings of Jesus and his great and wonderful earthly ministry, the miraculous aspect of this omnipotence and deity that was fused in human frailty. And they said, his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. Jesus is the saving name of God. Everyone say, Jesus. And so you find those things in the Gospels, but you do not find the birth of the church in the Gospels because it wasn't born there. For that reason, you cannot take isolated verses of scriptures out of the Gospels to prove doctrine. You can't because the church was not born there. Neither can you take isolated verses of scriptures out of the epistles to prove uh, a doctrinal point because the church had already been born. So the Gospels point the way to the church and the epistles point back to the church. In fact, I've made this statement in your presence before through the years in the course of various studies here that the Bible without the book of Acts is an empty hall because everything from Genesis through the end of Malachi says something is coming. The Gospels say he's here. But the fact that Jesus came was not enough. That still wasn't it. He said, the Holy Ghost is coming. You must be born again. Amen. So everything from Genesis through the Gospels points to something. It, we haven't found it. And uh, everything in the epistles point back to something that's already happened. So without the book of Acts, the Bible is an empty hall. You never find the answer. You don't know what was supposed to happen. Thank God for this book of Acts salvation. Thank God for the truth that has been given to us in this hour. I thank God for it. So in the book of Acts chapter 2, it says in verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Everyone say, from heaven. In other words, this did not come from the devil. It did not come from the lower parts of the earth. This came from heaven. Everyone say, heaven again. Heaven. <clears throat> suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. <clears throat> now, this is interesting. You will remember, I'm sure, that when God gave the written law at Mount Sinai to Moses and the Hebrew children, that inauguration was accompanied by wind and fire. But now it's a new dispensation. And when the church was born, <coughs> and this superseded the law in stone, as it were, and became an experience for man. The Holy Ghost, the birth of the church, was also accompanied by wind and fire. So here, if you read through, you'll find out that they were here in Jerusalem for the Passover. And they had come from all parts of the earth. And so here in 7 through verses 11, 12, it lists the various 
nations that Jews had traveled from back to the homeland to celebrate the Passover or what is called the Pesach in Hebrew. And uh, when the, the Holy Ghost fell, they were speaking with tongues. They were acting like drunk people, drunken people. And if you look in verse 12, it says, And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking. And there's always going to be mockers. Said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these men are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. That would have been nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my, my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And he goes on with prophetic words and insight. The preaching of Peter convinced the people that they had crucified the Messiah. So when they reached this place in his preaching, <clears throat> it says in verse 37, we'll look at verse, thir verse 36. Therefore, Peter said, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, in other words, you killed him, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked or convicted in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Verse 41. Then they that gladly, everyone say gladly, received his word, were baptized. And ladies and gentlemen, this gospel only works on the hungry and the thirsty. It does not work on the scoffers nor the mockers. It was never designed for them. It works only on those that are gladly willing to receive, that are looking for something more than they have, that want the truth. The truth will make you free. It doesn't set you free. It makes you free whether you like it or not. And that's where the convicting power of God comes in. Then you have the power of choice to decide whether you will embrace it or reject it. The truth does not set you free. It makes you free. That's why David said, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The connection is incredible, really. So those that gladly received it, they received it. And there were three thousand on the day of Pentecost that received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and they were baptized in the name of Jesus. 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. In other words, this business of being baptized in Jesus' name, receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues, that is the apostles' doctrine. Say apostles' doctrine. We are apostolic Christians. That's who we are. We are the originals. Look at your neighbor and say, now you know how important I am. <laughs> because we are the originals. There are a lot of non-originals out there, but we are the originals. Lift your hands and thank God for that. <laughs> God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I worship you for this hunger, for this thirst that is here. I thank you for the refreshing that I feel in the spirit here, just simply by your breathing upon us tonight. O oh, Master of the universe, 
bind us together. Anoint us, O oh Lord Jesus, to hear and to speak. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the birth of the Spirit. We thank you for the name of Jesus. We thank you for water baptism in Jesus' name. Thank you for the revelation of the oneness of God, for separation from this world of darkness. Thank you for the light of the gospel that is inside of us and upon us. Thank you for the bond of love that has made us one great family of God. I thank you for it. I bless the name of Jesus forever. And again, bind us together here in one mind and one accord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. It may be interesting for you to know and to understand that there is only three kinds, there is only three kinds of Christianity in the world. Only three kinds. <clears throat> and there's a revelation in this. There's a great understanding in this. And I want to transmit that to you because it will help you in preaching the gospel. It will help you in reaching the world. It will help you to be thoroughly furnished with answers that will give understanding to those who are looking for truth. There's only three kinds of Christianity in the world. Number one, there is apostolic Christianity. Number two, there is church father Christianity. And number three, there is reformation Christianity. And no matter what Christian church you step into, any place in the world, you have a 95% chance of stepping into one of these three kinds of Christianity. About a 95% chance, and you will. It'll be one or the other of these three. The other 5% are just spin-offs that come from one of these three kinds of Christianity. For example, apostolic Christianity was preached by the apostles. That's why it's called apostolic Christianity. It was an experienced Christianity. Everyone say experienced. Experienced. Apostolic Christianity is an experienced Christianity. And within 70 years, through the help of the Apostle Paul, they spread apostolic Christianity all over their, their known world, then known world. It was amazing, amazing. It shook the Roman Empire. In fact, I have listened to professors from Harvard and Yale universities in America that say it was Christianity that toppled the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire probably has been one of, it was the most ruthless empire that's ever existed in human history. Crucifixion, I just read something on it recently. It's, it's just, it's, it's inconceivable to me that any human being would consign anyone to the death by crucifixion. It's the most ruthless, brutal, beast-like, animalistic type imposition upon a human being that could ever come to you. It took from three to six days for some of them to die hanging on a cross. Where is the human sentiment? Where is human mercy in all of that? Where is any connection with God in all of that? To, ex to, to execute someone quickly for the death they committed, that's one thing. But to torture knowing what you're doing is another thing. So the Romans ruled the, their then known world with ruthlessness. They were barbaric. They were absolutely brutal. But what's interesting to me is that professors Degreed individuals, doctors of theology, philosophers, and uh, PhD individuals say it was Christianity that toppled the Roman Empire. You know why? Because the fire couldn't burn it, the lions couldn't eat it, and the walls couldn't hold it. The Christianity in the beginning was like a forest fire out of control. History tells us that Nero, one of the most despicable human beings that ever lived in this world, his wife 
was a convert of the Apostle Paul. She had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She was baptized in Jesus' name. She went from the palatial estate to the Mamertine prison, and she heard the Apostle Paul preach, and history says she was a convert of the Apostle Paul. That is that is incredible. It shows you the power of the Spirit of God. Ladies and gentlemen, they may fight you and me, but they cannot fight the God that's inside of us. There is nothing they can do because he is greater. He is greater. So in spite of the Roman Empire, ruthlessness, brutality, thousands of legions of soldiers, death by crucifixion, and all the things they did, Christianity destroyed the Roman Empire because it is greater. The Spirit of God is greater. In fact, the professor said that this Christian cult destroyed the Roman Empire with all of its might, with all of its ruthlessness. Christianity destroyed the Roman Empire. However, this is not a cult. This is the truth. It is God's gift to rescue humanity from the darkness of this present world. I thank God for the day he ever called my name. I thank God for the day he ever brought convicting power to me and convicted me and I came and knelt at his feet. So <clears throat> apostolic Christianity is an experienced Christianity and as I said, within 70 years, they shook their then known world. Church Father Christianity is a developed Christianity. It was developed by man. It took 300 years to fully establish this Church Father Christianity, and it evolved into what we know today as the Roman Catholic Church. But it took 300 years to instill that because Roman Catholicism or Church Father Christianity is not an experienced Christianity. It's a philosophy. It's an intellectual thing that you embrace. Reformation Christianity is also a developed Christianity. It was developed by man. It took 100 years to fully establish what we know today as denominational Christianity or Reformation Christianity. Because Reformation Christianity, the etymology of the word Reformation is reform, which means to reform the existing church that was in power, which was the Roman Catholic Church. And so actually it was a protest, and it became known as Protestantism. It was a protest to the Roman Catholic Church. And there were some great protesters, of which we will discuss perhaps later. But... <clears throat> Protestantism, or the protest against the Roman Catholic Church, Luther was successful. There were those before him, Haas, Savonarola, various ones. That they were, they were, most of them were burned alive at a stake. Um, Luther uh, survived in Germany because the princes of Germany fought for him and uh, against the Catholic Church. And so Luther was a successful reformer. But they were known as Protestants. They were protesters of the Roman Catholic Church. It took 100 years to instill all of that teaching into the then known world. For that reason, I am not a Protestant. I'm not. I'm not protesting anything. I am an apostolic, born again, book of Acts, Jesus give birth to kind of religion and Christianity. I'm not a protester. I'm not protesting. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not a pro Protestant. I am an apostolic believer. That's who we are. It sets you apart from everyone else, from everything else that exists in the entire world. All of denominational Christianity, all of it, is 495 years old as of this year. Luther was successful in 1517 AD. All of denominational Christianity is a little less than 500 years old, but what you and I have here in our hearts and souls today is 1,000 
979 years old. We go all the way back to 33 AD. No one else can make that claim. No one else can make that claim. Only us. That should make you at least arrogant with pride. <laughs> that you know what you have a hold of. People, there's nothing like knowing. And the greatest thing is to be able to prove it from the Bible. I wasn't raised in this. I was a Baptist when I was a little boy. I was in the Evangelical Free Church when I was in my late teens and early 20s. The Evangelical Free people, they were, they were a good people. And uh, they believed in going door to door and inviting people to church. And I did that. And Billy Graham was my hero, as I've told you before. And I went to Billy Graham Crusades. And I was, a youth, I was in Youth for Christ. I was in Campus Crusade. I was in all of those things. But then you people came into my life and it changed everything. <laughs> Thank you. But in the beginning, I wasn't saying thank you. I fought you because you told me basically you're not saved. Ugh. That went down like razor blades. I didn't like that because I believed I was. Because that's what I've been taught. But you people, you had such a knowledge of the Bible. I'd never met anyone like you. You could just quote scripture like that. Not only that, but when I looked into the eyes of you Pentecostals, there was a light in your eyes. There was a light. You could see it. And every time I'd look in your eyes when I was visiting your, your services, I, I would never look in your eyes because I would break down crying. And it was beneath my dignity to cry in public. I wouldn't do that. So I'd look at your shirt or your hair, but I would never look in your eyes because it would mess me up. It would so when I finally got baptized in Jesus' name and got the Holy Ghost, the first thing I did, I left the whole thing. I ran directly to the men's room to look in the mirror to see if I could see that same light in my eyes. And I messed that mirror up. I made a mess out of that mirror. I grabbed that mirror with my hands and I almost started crying because I could see the light. I could see that shine it was there look in your neighbor's eyes if that's permissible and you can and you can see a light you can see a light and that's what this world sees that's what the world sees when they come into us when they come in contact with us they see that light and you forget it you forget that it's there that's that's why I've walked in restaurants and people just stop eating and look at me and I've checked to make sure everything's together. <laughs> and everything is together. But it's not that. They feel something. It's like if you put a ring on this finger. And I'm not advocating jewelry. I'm just using this as an example. But if you put a ring on your finger, you're very much aware of it. You'll keep spinning it and working with it, you know, when it's new. But give it two or three weeks and you sort of forget it's there. Give it six months and give it a year and it becomes a part of your hand. Same thing with the Holy Ghost. When you first get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you are very much aware that He has moved in because everything is different. I mean, the sky is bluer. The clouds are more white. I mean, everybody is good. You want to help everybody. You just forgive everybody. And you're excited. And you don't care what people think. You just clap. You shout. You're out of control in church by other standards. And you don't care because <laughs> you are just, it's brand new. But give it six months, give it a year, a couple of years, and you forget that the Holy Ghost is alive in you. And He doesn't stay home when you go to the grocery store. He doesn't stay home when you go out shopping. He's there. When you walk in, He's with you. And if they don't have any concept of God in that dark place, they will stop and look at you. I was in first class on one particular flight in America, and somehow... Uh, this happened two or three years ago. But somehow, some question came up about this is the end. Well, I can jump right into that because I know a lot about all of this prophecy. And I began to just throw in things I knew in first class. Well, I mean, before we got to where we were going, I mean, those waitress, those, uh, those flight attendants, they, forgot, they weren't even doing their duty. They were just listening. They weren't doing their job. They were listening to what I had to say. And in fact, there were flight attendants from coach that came up, and they were listening to these things I was telling about God and His Word. They were just into it. 
Well, when the plane landed, you know, they had to scurry around and get everything in order. And so when the plane landed, I stood to get off, and most people in first class left right away, but I just picked up things, and as I was walking out, the flight attendant looked at me, she said, who are you? And my only answer was, one who knows. So if anyone ever asks you, who are you? Say, one who knows. And we do, we know. It's a wonderful thing to have the truth. The truth just absolutely makes you free of every other ideology, every other dogma, every other doctrine, whatever. It makes you totally, totally free. But back to my story. You people posed questions in my mind about truth that I had never heard before. So I made an appointment with my evangelical free pastor. I wanted to talk to him about baptism. I'd never been baptized anywhere, you know. I just never had been. But you people insisted, because it was in the book, repent and be baptized, and you just quoted that. It was ringing in my ears, you know how it is. You can't get rid of it. And so I was just fighting day and night and, and, and just struggling with this. But I could see it. It was in the book. It was in the Bible. So I went to Reverend Ramsland, my pastor in the Evangelical Free Church, and I said to him, I said, I, I, they, they knew that I had visited with you, but they didn't know how much you had got your clutches into me. They didn't realize what was going on. So I said to him, I said, you know, I've been thinking about getting baptized because you had preached it to me, that's why. And he said, well, you can be baptized if you, if you want to. I said, what do you mean if I want to? He said, well, it's not really necessary. It's just an outward sign of an inward cleansing. That's not what you said. And that's not what the Bible said. Peter commanded them to get baptized in Jesus' name. He didn't, think, he didn't say, think about it. Maybe we'll do it next week or whatever. He commanded them. In Acts chapter 10, when the Holy Ghost fell on them as Peter was preaching, you know what I mean? I mean, they, at the household of Cornelius, they got the Holy Ghost, and he commanded them immediately to be baptized in Jesus' name. Because that's what puts you in the covenant. Speaking with tongues does not put you in the covenant. It's baptism that puts you in the covenant. That's another, that's another lesson, but we can go there sometime. But it's incredible. Anyway, my pastor at that time said, well, you don't really have to be. It's not necessary. He said, in fact, we, we baptize here once a year. We baptized at Easter time. Well, Easter had just passed. So it's going to be a whole year before I can get baptized now. And I, I thought, you know. And, but I'd come back to you and you'd say, but you've got to be baptized. You, Lee, you need to be baptized. And I could, I could see it. It was, in, it was in the book. So <clears throat> I kept asking questions to my evangelical free pastor. All of a sudden... And there was, I was on this side of his desk, he was there, and there was a bookcase behind him. And there was a Bible lying on his desk between us. And when he went to answer my questions about salvation, he did not reach for the Bible. He spun in that chair and reached for a book written by the church fathers of the Evangelical Free Church. That is where he lost me, right there. Because I knew when he didn't reach for this book and he reached for a book written by another man, I had no hope with that. If I can't prove it out of this Bible, there's no hope. There's no hope. Because the Bible is the final source of appeal. If you can't find it in here, you better just get rid of it. It. Just knock it out. It's not worth it because only this is going to get you where you need to go in God. Tap your hands for a moment and just because you people have got it and I know that you've got it. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. So <clears throat> that's when I left the Evangelical Free Church and I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and I got baptized before that, of course. But it's the greatest, this is the greatest way to live in all of the world. But the interesting thing about it, the Holy Ghost does not petrify you, nor does he make a robot out of you. He doesn't. He does only what the Bible says. He is a comforter. You're still going to have problems, but the difference now is, now I have someone to help me with my problems. When you get the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost can help you with your problems. I've given a lot of my life to young people, especially when I pastored. And um, 
there were the young people in one particular church when I pastored, uh, they were having difficulties. It was, it was puberty, it was adolescence, it was dating, it was everything that young people go through in the transition between childhood and adulthood. And um, I remember this one boy came to me one day and he was having a real problem with his flesh, he really was. And um, that's all I need to say about that. But he poured out everything, he just told me everything and he was crying. And he, but he loved God, and he really, he really wanted to live for God. And I had prayed him through the Holy Ghost. He was just a great kid. <clears throat> when he got all done, I said, I have an answer for you. Well, his eyes just lit right up. I said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to the prayer room, and I want you to go to Jesus. And I want you to tell him exactly what you told me. I want you to use exactly the same words. I want you to tell him all the details with the same language you told me. He said, what? <laughs> In other words, he had no idea. See, to him, Jesus, God is some ethereal, gossamer, supernatural, far out being, deity that he can't approach. That's awful to think like that. Jesus is a friend. Real prayer is talking to God like you would any good friend. That's what it is. That's what prayer is. I said, I want you to go tell Jesus exactly what you told me. And here's why. I said, how old are you, son? He said, 17. I said, Jesus was 17 once. He was tempted in all points like as we are tempted. He's already been there, got the victory. You go tell him, and he'll help you more than I could ever help you. That kid took off for the prayer room. I'm telling you, folks, he prayed. I could hear him praying. It was wonderful. Amen. He made it. Amen. Yeah. No matter what your problem is, take it directly to God and tell it to him like you would any good friend. He's been there, done that. He will lift you, and he will help you. And the thing about Jesus, when everyone else gives up on you, he doesn't. And the thing I love most about Jesus is, when I call, I don't get these dumb, ridiculous, recorded messages. <laughs> Ugh. You can't even get a live human being anymore when you make a phone call. It's just one recording after another. When I pray, I get directly through to him. The line is never busy, folks. He's always there, morning, noon, or night. In the middle of the night, I can wake up and begin to pray, and God will be there, and he will help. Lift your hands and thank the Lord for that. I worship you for it, Jesus. Wrap your arms of love around every man, every woman, every young person, every adult here today. God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, hear and answer by fire. Hear and answer by fire, I pray today. Jesus, I bless the name of the Lord forever. Blessings and honor, O Lord, be thine. We lift our voices and worship you. We lift our voices and praise you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the touch of the Master's hand, for the sound of your voice. Lord Jesus, I praise you. I worship you, God. Blessed, blessed be the name of Jesus forever. I'm enjoying myself. Are you enjoying this? I can feel the Holy Ghost. Can you feel the Holy Ghost? Mm. The interesting thing I want to point out to you here, <clears throat> we have within this world, we have all kinds of Christianity. But there's only real three, only three major uh, kinds of Christianity in the world. And I repeat, Apostolic Christianity, which was an experienced Christianity. Church Father Christianity, which was a man-made developed Christianity. Evolved into the Roman Catholic Church. Then you have Reformation Christianity, again, which was a developed Christianity by man. And um, <clears throat> it took 300 years for the Catholic Church to become established. 100 years for Reformation Christianity to become 
established in the world. But I repeat for your knowledge and your hearing. What you and I are preaching and teaching today is 1,979 years old. All of the denominational Christianity is 495 years old as of today. For example, when Jesus, when God gave birth to his church in the book of Acts in Jerusalem, he did not give birth to the Roman Catholic Church. That's not what he gave birth to. Face it. He did not give birth to the Baptist Church. He did not give birth to the Lutheran Church. He did not give birth to the Methodist Church. He did not give birth to the Church of Christ Scientist Church. He did not give birth to the Mormon group. He did not give birth to the Jehovah's Witnesses. He gave birth to the Apostles' Doctrine, to Apostolic Christianity. He gave birth to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For what? For the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what he gave birth to. And apostolic Christianity is the only kind of Christianity that God places his hand of approval upon. Because he didn't give birth to the others. They're man-made. There are good people among those groups, and they're on, our way. they're on their way to this. A lot of them are on their way to this. There are incredible things beginning to happen. We had one ba whole Baptist church in America, the Southern Baptist Convention. They are the worst enemies of apostolic Christianity. They absolutely hate us. They preach against us. They don't believe in speaking with tongues. They're death against being baptized in Jesus' name. But some of our men went to one of their major conferences. Brother Haney was there. He told me this. He went and preached to some 300 Southern Baptist preachers about the oneness of God, baptized in Jesus' name, and filled with the Holy Ghost, the entire message. And when they got done, he said, Brother Stone King, most all of those Baptist preachers were on the floor rolling, speaking with tongues, and we baptized them, many of them. People... This, this is the truth. You can come from anything to this, but you cannot go from this to anything else. There's nothing else to go to. This is the end of the line. This is the end of the line. This is that. There's not another that coming. This is that. So get in this and go at it. You've got nothing to apologize for. I don't apologize for anything. I don't care if you like it or don't like it. I've got it and I know that I've got it. And since I've been through what I've been through, I'm getting tougher with age. And the older you get, the more you get away with it. And I like it. I like it. <laughs> in other words, in a few days, I'll be 72 years old. I've had the Holy Ghost almost 49 years. I've seen all kinds of things, people. And I'm never going to retire. I'm just going to get tougher. And I'm going to preach it harder. And I'm going to preach it straighter. And I'm going to preach it stronger. And I want to recruit you young people to help me. Get into the field. Help me to preach this because we're going to take the world by storm because there is no devil in hell nor combination of devils that can compete with us because greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. And there is no ism out there. There is no schism out there that is greater than this Acts 2.38 message. And you've got it and I've got it. You are powerful. You are the most powerful people on the face of the earth. No one can pray like an apostolic Christian. They can't do that. Other forms of Christianity, they cannot pray with the power that you pray with as an apostolic Christian. Because they don't even know who Jesus is. They don't even know who he is. They think he's some second person in a Godhead. He's not a second person. He is the Godhead. He's all of it. He's the Father of creation, the Son of redemption, the regenerating force, and the Holy Ghost. One God, invisible in the Old Testament, visible in the New Testament. Swallow it. That's how it is. <laughs> Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. The longer I live, I'm becoming more and more convinced. The greatest revelation that can come to you as a human being is that there is only one God. There are not two gods. There are not three gods. There's not a half a dozen gods. There's only one God. And his name is Jesus. Mm. Powerful thing. You ought to all be shouting amen. Amen. Because this is, amen means it is so. Everybody say, it is so. It is so. 
say the short version, amen. <laughs> it is so, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened to anyone. Mm. Something marvelous has just happened. Um, I, there are so many exciting things going on. I've seen, and I probably will do this on Sunday, but I have seen some of the greatest miracles of healing I've ever seen in my whole life in the last three or four months. I've never seen anything like it. God is doing something. There's revival in the earth. There's tremendous revival in the earth. And you people have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe that. I believe you're an open door to all of this Asia area. I've always believed that. I really believe you're the Antioch of the East. But I can tell you, the devil will try to stop you before you ever really get started. He will. So, my advice to you as a man of God here today, fight for this truth like you've never fought for it. Don't let anybody ever talk you out of this. Don't let anything ever pull you away from this because there's nothing else to go to. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing else to go to. This is that. Another that is not coming. This is in the Bible. This is what Jesus gave birth to. This is what the Holy Ghost gave birth to. He didn't give birth to denominational Christianity. He did not give birth to the Roman Catholic Church. He didn't. He gave birth to this wonderful repentance, baptism, this born-again experience that changes you forever. This is what he gave birth to. I presented just a few moments ago a book to Pastor Timothy. It's entitled From Rome to Jerusalem. And I brought a copy for your library. I understand you have a library, so I brought a copy. You will not be able to put this book down when you read it. And the book is a story written by an ex-Roman Catholic priest. This man began to read the Bible and he always felt like in the Catholic Church and he wanted to be a priest, he wanted to serve God, but he always felt like there was something missing that he didn't know about. So he got to reading the Bible on his own. This is his picture right here. And he could tell by reading the Bible that the Catholic Church was not preaching the Bible, the Word of God. So to make a long story short, he read and found this truth. He's baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he's one of our preachers in UPC in America today. He spent, I don't know how many years, writing this book. He goes through and explains all the tyrannies the treacheries of the Roman Catholic Church, how they condemned men who believed in one God and burned them alive at stakes. When I was in Bible college, church history was one of my favorite subjects. And Michael Savitas, I always was drawn to him in the classes. But when I read Brother Hanscom's account from history of how Michael Savitas was burned alive, it took me two days to get over it. I couldn't, I couldn't shake it from my mind. I couldn't, I was just, it did something to me, body, mind, and soul. The price that some people have paid to uphold and to live this wonderful, wonderful truth. Someone, this, this man pastors in, in Tennessee, and he wrote this book, and someone bought it and sent it to me. Well, I called him and got the talking. I said, Brother Henscombe, this is the greatest thing I've ever had my hands on because it's got facts, figures, dates, pictures of popes, pontiffs. It goes, I've never seen anything like it. And it's not just some theory or some idea. He's got facts, figures, dates, documented evidence from history. These things happened. And every Catholic that he's given this book to, has left the Catholic Church, been baptized in Jesus' name, and filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So I wanted you to have a copy of this in your library, and I wanted Pastor Timothy to have it. You won't be able to put, put it down. It's absolutely incredible. In fact, on the back of the cover, you can't see this, but uh, it's, it's the young priest, Hanscom, here, with fellow 
priest students in college, but if you look around his head, there's fire around his head. That's not a gimmick. That's not something that was done by touch-up artist. The camera caught the fire of the Holy Ghost around him, almost like a halo, because of the revelation that was coming to him and his hunger for God. God is going to use him with this book. The book is just incredible, but it gets even better than that. Th this is amazing. Give me just a minute here. There is <clears throat> a Catholic bishop. He's 71 years old. 71 years old. He got a hold of this book from Rome to Jerusalem. This Catholic bishop was bishop over 17 Catholic churches in Florida. Okay? He read, got a hold of this book. He has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I have a small photo of him. I've got several more at home. He has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues. And this Catholic bishop, when he got the Holy Ghost, fell out on the floor and laid on the floor on his back and spoke with tongues for over 30 minutes. He now is baptized in Jesus' name along with his nephew. And both of them are now in a UPC church in Florida. And he's spreading this everywhere. And I've got his testimony written down. And if they want to make copies of it and give it to you, they are willing to do so. I just got a hold of it. It's just amazing what the Holy Ghost is doing in this hour. So, Brother Hanscom said to this bishop, his name um, is Bishop Ron McCarthy. He said to him, he said, Ron, what are you, what's going to happen are you fearful of the consequences of the Roman Catholic Church when they find out you have left them and that you have embraced this monotheistic um, one God apostolic church? <laughs> the bishop's answer was, I couldn't care less. He said, I know this is true. I've got the Holy Ghost. He said, I was cheated out of this all of my life. He said, this is the greatest experience I have ever, ever had. He said, now I know what I was supposed to be. He spent 71 years of his life in the Catholic Church, most of it being a bishop, trying to serve God and see how good God is. If you are hungry for God, he will turn the world upside down for you to find it. This bishop now has the Holy Ghost, and he's beginning to preach it, and he's beginning to tell it. I feel like clapping. There's a clapping spirit here. So just clap your hands, all you people, and just shout unto the Lord with the voice of triumph. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. <clears throat> Do it again. I feel something here. I just feel something here. Utorova Rasha Taya. Utorova Rasha Tato Keshata. Utorova Rasha Tato Keshaka. That's it. Let God do with you what he wants to do with you. Utorova Rasha Taya. Utorova Rasha Tata Rava Rasha Taya. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I do this an awful lot, but would you just reach over and lay your hands on the person next to you or take a hold of their hand and just begin to pray with them. I feel an anointing on you. I've always felt an anointing on you people, but there's something special here tonight in this place. I can feel it. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you, God. I thank you. 
I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for the blessing of God that is in this place. Help us to feel the brush of angels' wings. Help us to hear the sound of your voice. Oh, God, tonight I praise you and I thank you. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Mm. I worship you, God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that something in the Spirit will happen right now that will lift some kind of a cloud or shadow of darkness that is trying to come over this church. I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you'll disperse that cloud of darkness. Jesus. Jesus. That the light of revelation, the light, O oh God, of the truth, O oh God, will destroy, O oh God, that cloud, that shadow of darkness. Do it by the authority of the word of God, by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Something is happening. You can feel it. God, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I worship you for it. Jesus, I worship you for it. Blessed, blessed be the name of Jesus forever. I've never thought about doing this before. I never have. But um, something happened about a month ago uh, that I started thinking about this and I've started doing it. I've never thought about praying that God would help me to never be deceived. I've never thought about that because I believe the truth. I've lived this nearly 48 years, 49 years, October 6th. I've never even thought about such a thing. But there are so many voices in this hour. There are so many spirits in this hour. And so I started praying, Lord Jesus, no matter what happens, no matter who comes or goes, don't ever let me be deceived. Jesus, help me never to be deceived. And I've just prayed that. And for some reason, I just feel to share this with you. And every time I've prayed it, it's like I have felt a very soft touch of the Holy Ghost come on me. It's like the hand of God has just sort of patted me on the back for such a thing. He paid such a price for you and I to have what we have, for you and me to have what we have. So just for a moment, if you feel so led, lift your hands, your voices in your hearts, and pray, Lord Jesus, don't ever let me be deceived. Because, ladies and gentlemen, there are many voices out there. There could be even some voices in among us. That's it. Let your voice out. Don't worry about your neighbor. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Jesus, help me never to be deceived. Lord Jesus, help me never to be deceived. Help me, God, to embrace as never before this apostolic doctrine, this apostolic truth, this apostolic separation, this apostolic holiness. I'm asking you, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Und dort war der Rischer, der Varako, Shatai, der Rachashayal. Und dort war der Rachashayal. Jesus, deliver us from all evil. Deliver us, O oh God, from itching ears, O oh God, I pray. And the voices, O oh God, I, O oh Raka of untruth. God, deliver us from those voices in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Now just clap your hands and thank the Lord for hearing, for answering. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. So, let's look a little more closely at some of this. <clears throat> The church was born in 33 AD and it lasted very powerfully until about 100 AD. In the beginning there was only one kind of Christianity and that was Acts 2.38 Christianity preached by the Apostle Paul and the other Apostles. It was the only Christianity that existed. In the beginning there was just one kind of Christianity and everybody knew that those Christians believed that Jesus was the Messiah that he had been crucified raised from the dead ascended and that he had sent back the promise of the Holy Ghost and that they spoke with tongues and that these believers Christian believers and they were first called Christians uh, at Antioch, I think it was. They, they all had been baptized by immersion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, these early Christians, they believed there was only one God and they lived a separated holy life from the Roman Empire and the world around them. And they also knew that these early Christians could lay hands on people and they would be healed. That's what early Christianity was, and still is. <clears throat> so, you were either a Christian, you were a Jew, or you were an out-and-out -out heathen. That's what it was in the beginning. You were either a heathen, you were Jewish, or now you were the people of the way, this new, this new Christianity, they call it, and they knew what Christians believed. And that apostolic doctrine lasted powerfully until about 100 AD. But with the death of the last apostle, <clears throat> there was no one to keep the gospel alive with all of its tenets, with all of its uh, details. For example, Samuel in the Old Testament was a judge, but Samuel was a circuit-riding judge. He was like a circuit-riding preacher. He went all over the land and preached the truth of Judaism and kept the truth alive in the hearts of the Jewish people. Samuel was like that. Well, the apostles were like that because you have to understand they didn't have a written Bible then. It was in the process of being compiled and even those copies that were available they tell me from church history and what I've studied that in the beginning it would have cost you ten to fifteen thousand dollars just for one copy of the Bible or the scriptures they had so far compiled so there was there was no way to own a Bible you, could, you couldn't own it and with the apostles being martyred off and killed and dying of natural causes there was no one to circuit ride, so to speak, as Samuel had done, uh, to keep the gospel intact. So what happened was, there arose from in history what is called apologist. And apologist were those who basically apologetically explained what they knew about the gospel. Uh, you've heard me teach Daniel's 70th week here and about John the beloved 
being the last apostle and how he is one of those witnesses in the book of Revelation that comes back. You'll remember that. So John is the last apostle. But I personally, you have, there's no Bible record he ever died. I think he was, I believe from Bible evidence that I can put together that he was simply raptured like uh, Elijah was out of the Isle of Patmos. But his writings got back to the mainland. So now what we have is people, there is a famine in the land for the word of God. That's what I'm saying. There was a famine in the land for the word of God. So they didn't have access to the scriptures. Well, you have the um, apostolic fathers that succeeded the lives and the deaths of the actual 12 apostles. Apostolic fathers. One of them was famous, and we'll talk about him again. His name was Polycarp. History says that Polycarp and John, the beloved, were personal friends. They knew each other. And Polycarp is the one that they burned alive at a stake. And he said, 80 and 6 years I have served him. He hath done me no wrong. No, I will not deny him. And he even asked them to untie his hands. He stood of his own volition, his own power. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. And was burned alive because he would not recant this Jesus and this apostolic truth. So what happened is the apologists came on the scene and they began to explain the scriptures to their way of thinking. It's like four of us seeing a car accident. Every one of us is going to have a different story. And that's what happened in those early years with the apologist. They apologetically wrote and explained some things away. And so the truth became pretty distorted in a lot of ways. And that gave birth to, there was terrible persecution, which we'll study tomorrow, but that gave birth then to the rise of the Roman Catholic Church. And then, of course, that ended with the Reformation, Christianity taking it over or protesting against it. But God has restored in our day this whole truth. So now, with just those simple statements made, so you get some sort of a pictorial picture in the theater of your mind's eye. Let's go back and look at something. <clears throat> Luther, the Lutheran Church began in 1517. They saw justification by faith. In other words, they saw justification by faith rather than the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church. And then <clears throat> the Presbyterian Church was never heard of until 1536 AD. They saw communion as a memorial, not as transubstantiation as the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Then in 1580 was the Congregational Church, which saw a separation of church and state. Then in 1609, the Baptists came on the scene and they saw water baptism by immersion rather than sprinkling as the church in history had done, the Roman Catholic Church. So the Baptists were never heard of until 1609 AD. The Methodist Church came into existence in 1739 and they saw a need for personal holiness. In fact, the reason they were called Methodist is because these people practiced holiness methodically. They had a method and they practiced their holiness methodically. Then in 1820 AD, the Christian church saw baptism for remission of sins. So they, they kept the church in history, basically, it just almost uh, faded away. It became uh, just the Dark Ages. But then in 1900, Trinitarian Pentecostalism received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. So we're getting closer back now to what the apostles preached up until 100 AD. And then in 1914, they saw the revelation of the mighty God in Christ or the oneness of God and they begin to baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's very interesting about this though, 
The Bible says in the book of Acts, he left not himself without a witness. From 33 AD until the present hour, somewhere in the world, this apostolic doctrine has always been preached, maybe, maybe to small groups, but it's always been preached somewhere. But now the latter reign has begun in my lifetime and we're back to apostolic Christianity and it is literally tearing up the world. It really is. I have some contacts that tell me that in, even in Islamic countries, dreams are coming to major Muslim leaders. Jesus is coming to them and telling him, I am the true Messiah. There is a shaking in the land. There's an underground church in Iraq. There's an underground church in Iran. There's an underground church everywhere. I was just with the missionary, Brother Sterin, to Lebanon. That boy's my convert. He's one of the few people, maybe the only one, in the Middle East that's actually winning Muslims because he speaks Arabic, he writes Arabic. In fact, I think 85% of all Arabic literature that you buy from the Pentecostal Publishing House has been written by Mark and Marianne, his wife. I just saw them. They were home for their daughter's wedding. But they're actually, he said that one king, one king someplace in the Middle East has contacted him hearing that he believes in only one God and they're making appointments with Mark to come and hear about one God. I, have, I pray every day, I've been praying every day that apostolic revival will break out in every Muslim country so great that they cannot fight it. Every day I keep praying that, I pray, I keep praying because they can't fight it. That prayer works, people. I don't just believe prayer works. I know that prayer works, but you've got to be specific. So I am praying every day that apostolic revival breaks out so great in every Muslim country, they cannot fight it. And it's happening. There are things happening. There are incredible things happening. Jesus, I praise you for it. I worship you for it. God, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I met a man in Stockton, California. He's a very distinguished, tall-looking uh, Muslim man, Arab man. And he has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and been baptized in Jesus' name. And I heard he was in the audience and I wanted to meet him. And so I made some statement about Islam and he wanted to know how I knew. And uh, so he came and I met him and I talked with him and he is totally converted. I mean Muslims, when they are really converted to this apostolic Christianity, they make tremendous apostolic Christians. They're, they're really, they make tremendous Christians. But this man started crying and he had a lovely family and a son, I think. He said, Brother Strong King, I never can go back to my old country. I never can go home to my homeland because they'll kill me because I've converted to Christianity. In fact, what's interesting about this, Brother Sterin told me in Lebanon that the Muslims don't care how many of their people come to his services and get the Holy Ghost. They don't care about that. But the moment they find out they've been baptized in Jesus' name, they kill them. Because baptism is what really separates you from this world and every other religion. And baptism in Jesus' name is the only way to be baptized. There's no other way to be baptized. There's no other way to be baptized. It's the only formula that works. If you're baptized in the titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you don't have his name, you have his titles. There's no power in the titles. The power is in the name. Mm. 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 You'll never ever see a Trinitarian loaded down with the gifts of the Spirit because they can't be, because they don't even know who Jesus is. They don't even know who he is. But Mark told me, he said, they will kill him the moment they find out they've been baptized in Jesus' name. Because to the mindset in Islam, it's baptism that totally separates you from whatever you were before. They don't care how much they speak with tongues as long as they never get baptized in Jesus' name. See, the devil doesn't want, because he's coming back for people who call by his name. That's why the devil fights that harder than anything else in the entire world. But it's too late for him, for us, because we got away. We're baptized in Jesus' name. And we're not going back. We're not going back. 
if you join me in that, would you clap your hands and just let your voice out? Jesus, I worship you. I praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Jesus. In fact, Mary Ann, Mark's husband uh, there in Lebanon, she told me, she said, Brother Stone King, many times she said, uh, when we first got there, she said, when Mark went out in the morning to start the car, I take the children and go, go to the back of the house in case the car blow up. I said, I, said, I, said I, I didn't realize those kids were living like that because they were my converts. I mean, I just love those kids. And, uh, but that's how they lived. And the Roman Catholic Church in Lebanon fears them. You know why? Because it has spread among the Muslim community that this Mark Sterren, this missionary from America, believes in only one God and that people are healed miraculously when he lays hands on them. So Muslims are driving two hours one way, bringing their dying parents and grandparents to Mark for him to pray for them. And he lays hands on them and prays for them and they're healed. Imagine that kind of news in the, in the Muslim community. And he's gone to the hospital and prayed for people that were already dead and he has raised the dead. They came back to life. So the Catholic Church calls him the one that goes about doing good. I would say he's doing some good, wouldn't you? And they fear that. See, they fear that. And the devil fears you more than anything else in the entire world. And the devil, I've said this before here, but the devil fights the hardest where he fears the most. Sometimes I think I must be doing really good <laughs> because the battle is really bad. But I've said, devil, you just do whatever you want to do, but there's nothing you can do. Mm. Remember I preached a message here once, I'm in the covenant? Do you remember that? I spent two years studying baptism between Old Testament circumcision and New Testament uh, water baptism, which is New Testament circumcision. Water baptism in Jesus' name replaced the physical uh, circumcision in the Old Testament. So when I got the whole study together and, I, and the revelation, and I'd, I'd, I'd studied till one or two o'clock in the morning and beyond sometimes in my office, in my home, and the whole revelation would come in my office and I'd break down crying and I'd just lay my face on that desk and just sob and thank God. I mean, the whole room would be filled with the spirit of revelation. I mean, Jesus was so real. It was just like I could reach out and touch him and I'd just weep and cry. And when I got the message all put together, I saw, you see, it was the water that separated Israel from Egypt. Mm. The water is what separated Israel from Egypt. Egypt was a type of sin. When they left, there was a type of repentance. When they went through the Red Sea, it was a type of baptism. They were baptized into Moses and in the cloud and the sea. They came out on the other side and they crossed over the promised land, which is a type of the Holy Ghost. So it's death, burial, and resurrection. It's repentance, baptism, and in Jesus' name of the Holy Ghost. But here's what's interesting about it. Pharaoh made the mistake of his entire military career when he sent his armies out to follow those Hebrew children. He followed him all the way to the edge of the water, but where he made his drastic, demolishing mistake is when he commanded those soldiers into that sea. He could follow him to the edge of the sea, but he could not get through the water. He was not a believer. He could not get through the water. And the walls of the sea came crashing down in upon him and destroyed him. Pharaoh could follow the Hebrew children to the water, but he could not get through the water. When the Hebrew children came out on the other side, they were totally forever separated from Egypt. The devil can follow you all the way to the edge of the baptistry tank, but he cannot get through the water. And he'll follow you and try to talk you out of this and try to get you to come back because he realizes you're about to get away. And when you get away and you got the name of Jesus, you're going to have power over him. And he's having a nervous breakdown right while you're being baptized. But when you step out of that water, 
That water separates you in Jesus' name from everything you've ever done. It separates you from the world. It separates you from Egypt. The devil may follow you to the edge of the baptistry, but he cannot get through the water. In other words, what I'm saying, you have already been delivered. You just don't realize how delivered you really are because when you were baptized in Jesus' name, when you came out of the water, you left the devil on the other side. So when I got this revelation all together and that message all together, I sit down in my home. I don't know if you'll think this is wisdom or not. I don't know if it's boldness, but it's me. I'll put it that way. This is me. I sit down in my home one day and I said, devil, come here. And he's got to come because I've got the name of Jesus. I've got the power over him. I've got it. I said, devil, come and get me if you can. Come and get me if you can. But you can't get through the water. You can't get through the water. And if you try, I'll bury you. I'll drown you like Pharaoh of old. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. I got away. You got away. Do you understand that? You understand that you are a totally new creature? That you've got the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. You've got the power of the name of Jesus in your life. And there is no ism. There is no schism. There is no cult. There is no devil. There is no Buddhism. There is no Hinduism. There is no Islam. There is no denominational Christianity that can separate you from what you've got a hold of. You've got the power. You've got the power to convert. You've got the power to lay hands on people and they will be healed. That's who you really are. That that's who you really are. That is who you really, really are, people. You've got that power. So don't be, don't be intimidated by your friends in church. Don't be intimidated by what people may think. It doesn't matter what people think. You've got it, and I want you to demonstrate it. Mm. I told you I haven't changed. You need to get into this like you've never gotten into it. People, it's now or never for us. It's now or never. You ought to come to every service you come to and just take it over. That's what you ought to do. Save you the preaching. <laughs> Save the pastors. Preach. You people have it enough, enough preaching. I could take almost any one of you here. I wouldn't do this, but I could parachute you out over some jungle someplace <laughs> and drop you there, and you could preach Baptism in Jesus' name, repentance, the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues, lay hands on people and they would be healed. Amen. You could baptize them in Jesus' name and it would, it would be valid. That's who you really are. You are a believer. If you ever wake up to who you really are as a Bible believer, you will become a fanatic. You will. Amen. But you'll have converts too. Because there's nothing like this. Nothing can compete with this. Nothing can compare with this. There's nothing they can do. There's nothing they can do. Look at your neighbor and say, I've got what he's talking about. Look back and say, I'm going to use it. This may not be wisdom, but look back and say, start tonight. <laughs> Why not? There's no time like the present. There's no time like the present. People, I want something to happen to you. This time, this time, I want something to happen. The, the whole thing is come encounter Jesus. Well, if you encounter him, you're going to become just like him. He said, you'll do what I do. That's what he said. That's what he said. You know the real truth about me. I'll tell you the real truth about me. I'm no one special. I really am not. People think I am. And I'm glad for that because it makes a place for me in society. <laughs> but I'm not impressed with myself. I never have been. I'm impressed with Jesus. I am. In fact, an older pastor called me last year. And um, a very good friend of mine. He's always treated me like his own boy. And uh, we exchanged greetings and whatever. And he, I said, uh, he said, Lee, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. He said, well, I've been worried about you. And I, I said, why? He said, I've just been really worried about you. I said, well, I'm doing fine. He said, no, I don't mean that. I said, well, well what? He said, he said, your name is a household word. Your picture is plastered everywhere. I don't want you to get too impressed with yourself. Well, I started laughing. <laughs> I wasn't being disrespectful. I just thought it was funny. I still think it's funny. 
And I started laughing. At I said, what do you mean? He said, I just don't want you to get too impressed with yourself. I said, well, I'll tell you a secret. I've never been impressed with myself. Never have been. I said, now other people are. And I'm glad for that. And I always said that. I said, because it makes a place for me in society, but I'm not impressed with myself, never have been. I said, you have nothing to worry about. I'm in good shape. I'm not impressed with myself because I know something. You know who I really am? I'll tell you who I am. I'm just a normal, typical Bible believer. That's what I am. I've laid hands on people for healing within eight hours after I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and they were healed. I've been at this from day one. I've always believed it. It's in the book. I found out in here. These signs follow them that believe. I'm a believer. I just went out and did it. Well, that makes me really special because nobody else is doing it. But if you all get to doing it, I better learn something new because you're going to throw me out. I mean, I bet that's how people are. They'll, they're fickle. They'll pat, throw you out tomorrow, take you in today. <laughs> that's how it really is. So, but I still want you to, in fact, I've told many, many young people, I said, look, and, and God has helped me to rescue some kids, and uh, I've got a hold of some young people right now. Oh, they have got a hold of God, and they're very young. I'm, I may talk about this later, but I met a man last year since I was here. Um, he's only 23. That man is a prophet. That, that man has got a hold of God. He is something. I got another one that I'm working with. He is what, 25 or 6. Another one is about 17. Just got a hold of him. That, I meet these kids and, they've, and the hand of God is on them. So what I do is I'm networking them together so they have a support system. That's what I want. I want these kids to know each other. It's, it, they know that I'm behind them, but when they find another 18, 19 year old that just preached this last weekend and 10 got the Holy Ghost, that's a whole nother world. And it catapults them on and they, they become a support system. They encourage each other. They lay hands on each other and they're praying for each other and they're transmitting. Is that exciting? I mean, is that exciting? And there are young people like that right here. There, there are people like that right here. There are adults like that right here. Lift your hands and just thank the Lord for that for a moment. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let your voice out. Don't, 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 be, don't worry. God, help them to see. Help them to envision themselves. Let this happen, God, for every man, every woman. Here I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hushata Ravarashataya. Hutara Varashatata Kareshataya. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. I just believe in you people so much. I always have believed in you people. From the day first day I came here, I've always believed in you people. There's just no one like you. Your worship is incredible. But what I started to say a while ago with all these young people, I've just I've just told them, you know, they say, oh, Brother Stone King, thank you for this, thank you for that. I said, that's okay, no problem. I said, but I ask one thing. Someday when I'm very old and very tired and I walk by, speak to me. Don't act like you don't know who I am. And send me an offering. <laughs> and so if all these kids send me an offering, I'm going to be in good shape. There's no doubt about that. But offering or not, the greatest thing is to be used by God. I mean, why stoop to be a king when you could be a preacher? The calling of God is the highest calling in the entire world. I mean, imagine this, that God has called you to be an ambassador for Him. That God has entrusted you with an ambassadorship to take Him to the world to represent Him. What a glorious, what an incredible honor that is. And the key to being used mightily by God is availability. God has never had a perfect vessel to use. He's always had to use what was available. So I told God last year and the year before, I went through all the mistakes, you know, Abraham laughed and Elijah sat down and cried and whimpered like a leaf in the autumn wind and David failed in everything you can fail in, I think. Paul murdered Christians. Peter cursed and swore after three years of walking with Jesus. He cursed and swore and said, I don't even know him, never saw him. So I 
sit down one day and listed all the mistakes of all these great people that were used by God. And they were mightily used by God. I said, now, Jesus, there it is. Here's all this list of failures. I'm not guilty of one, th one thing they did. If you can use them, you can use me, and I volunteer. And that's exactly how I think. If God could use some of those people, he can use me. He can use me. And I close with this. My time is already gone. <clears throat> I traveled 32 hours yesterday with delays to get here. Um, there was a mix-up at the airport. I didn't get picked up immediately. I got to bed at 4.30 this morning. If I'm making sense, it's another miracle, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Tomorrow things should be better for me. <laughs> but I wanted to come, and I'm just delighted to be here. I'm thrilled to be here. But I want to tell you this. When I was pastoring, we, had, we did a lot of work. Uh, and it was a Roman Catholic area that I uh, was pastoring in. <clears throat> and we ran a four-page ad in the newspaper offering a $100 reward for anyone that would come forward and show that anyone had ever been baptized in the New Testament church in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. No one came to collect the other dollars because it's not in the book. It's not there. In fact, Matthew 20, 19 appears once in the entire Bible. The Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. It takes at least two or three witnesses to condemn anyone or to bring any judgment or to establish anything. It is the the judicial law of the Old Testament in the mouth of two or three witnesses. That's why the trial of Jesus went on all night long. They could not get the witnesses to say the same thing, and they could not condemn him unless they had two or three witnesses that had the same story, and they were just lewd men of the basest sort hired from the streets to lie against Jesus. They could not, they could not condemn him. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Matthew 28, 19 appears once in the entire Bible. But baptism in Jesus' name appears four times. Even if you're not a believer, just a gambler, I'd be baptized in Jesus' name. It's four to one in favor of baptism in Jesus' name. I mean, read the book. I mean, just read the book. I got a better chance of making it being baptized in Jesus' name. It's four to one in favor of baptism in Jesus' name. That's the only gambling I'm going to do right there, but that's it. Mm, just thank God for a moment you were baptized in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. <clears throat> So we ran, we ran ads like this, and this is the story. Eventually what happened was Roman Catholic priest wanted to talk to us. Hmm. So we arranged and we met with them. And uh, we, taught, we witnessed them about the baptism of the Holy Ghost because some of their people were getting it. And they weren't real happy about that at that time. And so they wanted to know about So we... We went through all of this, and um, they listened, and they said, well, they said, you have to understand, you are just our wayward children. You're, you're our daughters from the Roman Catholic Church. I said, no, no, we're not. They said, yes, you belong to the Roman Catholic Church. You came out of us. I said, no, no, we didn't. He said, well, how do you baptize? I said, we baptize by immersion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That priest looked at me. He said, then you didn't come out of us. I said, no, you came out of us. <laughs> Case closed. Mm. I witnessed to one Catholic seminarian student, and I will close with this. On the street corner waiting for a bus for me to go to work after school and he was going back to the theological seminary <clears throat> and I got to witness him but you know Acts 238 the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues all of this and uh, he was sort of interested and not totally 
and at this time, when, you know, we missed the bus because I, I was witnessing too long. So I felt badly. So I ran in and I had a student friend. I said, look, I've been witnessing and we've missed the bus. Would you take, help me take him with your car to the seminary? He said, yes, yes, I will. So he came out and we jumped in the car. And um, I said to him, I said as we drove, I said to the driver, drive slowly. So <laughs> that's how I am. So he drove slowly and I kept witnessing, you know. But before this, just before he came out with the car, he had a copy of his Bible, which is the Dewey Version, and it's more pointed in some of the doctrinal statements even than the King James. So I opened it to Acts chapter 2, and I said to him, I said, I want to read you something here. I said, was Peter your first pope? He said, oh, yes. Very emphatic about that, you know. I said, you're positive that Peter was your first pope? He said, yes. I said, you would declare that. Peter was your first pope. Yes, he was my first pope. His word infallible. Yes. I said, let me, let me read something to you. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I said, Now, this is what your first pope preached. Where did you people get off the track? He said, I don't know. I said, You better find out. <laughs> so, <laughs> we get in the car with his head spinning, okay? So, <laughs> I mean, all his defenses are gone. I, and if we drove along, I said, there's a little chorus we sing. I said, our music is wonderful. I said, you would love our worship. I said, so I want to teach you a little chorus so you remember me, as if he wouldn't remember me, you know. <laughs> so <clears throat> I said, the chorus goes like this. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. All day long we sing this song. Jesus writes our every wrong. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. And he's between us, the driver and me. And I said, it's not hard. And so after a few minutes, I got him to sing it. <clears throat> he was singing with us. So then I said, now, I said, when we sing in our services, we also clap. I said, I want you to clap. I said, the driver, you keep your hands on the wheel, but he and I are <laughs> going to clap. So I started singing <laughs> <laughs> we're a happy people yes and this guy is clapping with us you know it's amazing <laughs> so then I said to him I said look <clears throat> there's another set of lyrics we also sing with this course because he now he's a happy person <laughs> he's clapping <laughs> and all of this I said so now I want to teach you this we're a happy people yes we are we're a happy people yes we are been baptized in Jesus' name, spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. <laughs> he just looked at me. I said, oh, come on, sing it. You'll like it. So he, when we got him to the seminary where he was going, he was clapping in the car with us, singing, not just softly, but in there singing, belting it out. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. Been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost came, I'm not exaggerating. He got out of the car and started walking. And he was walking down that sidewalk singing, We're a happy people. Yes, we are. Been baptized in Jesus' name. Spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came. Do you know that car here? He'll never forget me. I can tell you that. <clears throat> Let's try singing it together if I've got a voice left. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. Been baptized in Jesus' name. Spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. Clap. You'll like it. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. We're a happy people. Yes, we are. Been baptized in Jesus' name. Spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came. 
We're a happy people, yes we are.